things as he poured his life into them. And after writing those things, he then wrote this in verses 27 to 30. He wrote, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. Now look at verse 29. Man, this goes radically against the theology of a lot of people in our world today. Listen to this. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Starting in verse 27, Paul encourages the Philippian Christians to likewise live their lives fully surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And in these verses, we see the fruit that a Christ-centered, fully surrendered life produces in God's people and in his church. So again, what does a Christ-centered focus produce? And this is in your bulletin if you want to follow along. Number one, Christ-centered focus produces, produces Christ-honoring obedience. Look at verse 27 again. Only conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul urged the Philippian Christians to live their lives in a way that glorified God. Now, what I want to do for the next few minutes is break this phrase down just kind of word by word or a couple words at a time. First of all, look at what it says there in verse 27. Only conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. Let's stop with the first word there, only. This is a very, very important word here. This word was not added into the English to make this sentence flow correctly. This word is actually there in the original language, and it is the word monon from which comes the prefix we add to many English words such as monarchy, which is a nation that is ruled by what? By one leader. Or what I'm doing right now, this is not a dialogue, this is a monologue. I am speaking and you are listening, and, and, and hopefully... While I'm giving this monologue, monologue sermon, I'm not doing so in a monotone voice, right? A monotone speech is when someone speaks with a single tone throughout the whole speech. And if I ever do that, there is no offense at all if you go and get three handfuls of coffee to bring back to the seat with you because you will need that. You've, we've all been in monotone speeches before, and sometimes they're very difficult to get through. The, the word that he uses here, monon, means single or one. And so, so starting out this verse, the idea here that Paul is getting at is only conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. In other words, the Christian's singular focus, our only focus should be on this. The greatest focus of our life, the singular focus of our life should be to live our lives in such a way that Christ is glorified. So he writes here only, and then he says this, conduct yourselves. Now this is it's two words of the English, conduct yourselves, but it's only one word in the original language, and it literally means to live a certain way, but in conjunction with other people. And, and this word would have made a lot of sense to the original readers of this letter. It, the, Philippi was a Roman colony, and the Philippian people were therefore, they were Roman citizens, and by using this word that meant to conduct oneself according to the customs and the laws of the state, Paul was then bringing this word over and likening this to the Christian living a certain way according to the statutes of God's kingdom. So here, Paul was writing the Christian community in Philippi and urging them to collectively conduct themselves in a way that lined up with the ethos of the kingdom of God, which they were to reflect in Philippi as Christians there. They were to collectively show the world the will of God and the ways of God and how they were living their lives individually and as God's people in Philippi. And so he writes, only conduct yourselves, and then he says this, in a manner that is worthy. This is the idea of, it, of, of, of a way in a manner that is fitting or suitable or appropriate. Now, I'm going to use an illustration here, and, and some of you are going to relate to this, and others of you are going to think I'm really strange when I give you this illustration. But when we were kids, many of us had a certain dream that we remember vividly, and we probably had this dream over and over and over again. To this day, 
not just when I was a kid, but to this day, I will still have dreams where I am at a church service or I am in a, in a classroom or in a business and all of a sudden, I realize I'm in my underwear. <laughs> Anyone relate to that? Have you ever had dreams like this? Okay, two of you have. I am the oddball in this room. <laughs> but, but, and, and I'll get terrified in that dream. How in the world did I not remember to put on clothes today? I mean, I, I vividly have that thought in the dreams. How did this happen? How did I get ready, go to my car, drive here, and not realize this? Or I'll, I'll, this is another dream I'll have to this day, and maybe this is just a pastor thing, but I'll have a dream that I'm at a formal event. Like I'm, at a, I'm doing a wedding for someone. I'm officiating a wedding for someone. And then I realize that in the middle of the sermon, I have on shorts and a tank top. Or I'll be at a casual event, like, a, like swimming or something, I'll have a suit on. And those dreams are awful because in each of those, I was simply not dressed in a suitable way that fit the occasion. And here Paul writes that Christians are to conduct themselves in ways that are suitable, in ways that are appropriate, in ways that are fitting, in ways that line up, he writes here, with the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel of Christ? What is most basic meaning, the Greek word is euangelion, it means, it means good news of glad tidings. The mess, listen, the message of Christ revealed to us in his word, my friends, is good news. It is good news of glad tidings. It is the news of Christ who came to save his people. It is the news of God reconciling man unto himself, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ to bring fallen man unto himself as an act of God's extraordinary grace. In mercy. So put all of this together, and here's what Paul is saying. He was writing the church at Philippi, and he was reminding them that they were to live their lives in such a way that was fitting, in such a way that was suitable for the gospel, in a manner that lined up with the good news of Christ that they proclaimed to believe. For Christians individually and for the church collectively to not be aligned with and living out the will of God causes incredible damage to our witness in this world. It, it, listen, it matters how we live. It matters how we live. We live in a day and age that kind of says, do whatever you want to do. We live in a day and age that is antinomian, meaning that they just believe whatever law you want to keep, you keep that law, you keep that ethic, you do whatever you want to do. Everyone is a law unto themselves. But listen, how we as Christians live in this world matters. How many people have been turned off by Christianity by Christians who say they believe one thing on Sunday, but then they find that person living a totally different way in the workplace or in the marketplace on Monday. How many have been jaded by the church when they see fighting and they see disunity and they see Christians, listen, mercilessly and hatefully attack, attacking each other, listen, typically over silly things that don't matter a bit. Listen, the time for the church in our world today to quit fighting over stupid things has long been passed. We have one mission. Our singular focus is to line our lives up with the will of God, to live out and to proclaim this gospel in the world in which we live. How we live matters. Christian, Christian local church, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, what does this exactly mean? Well, one thing to always remember when studying the Bible is when we find a verse like this that, that maybe kind of seems familiar to us, when we find a verse like this and we know that there are other verses that are very similar to this, we should look to other verses to help us gain some insight into the meaning. So, first of all, this phrase here at the beginning of verse 27, or phrases very similar to this phrase, are used several other times in Paul's writings. And so I've got a slide, Jeremiah, if you'll bring this up. For example, Colossians 1.10 says this, and these are all Paul's writings, by the way, so that you will walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord, to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's very similar to what Paul wrote here in Philippians 1.27. How about Ephesians 4.1, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus? Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Or 1 Thessalonians 2, 12, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, I want you to notice a theme in these verses here. 
in Colossians here, so that you will walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. Ephesians 4 here, walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Second Thess- or Seth- Th- First Thessalonians 2, walk in a manner, and here it is again, that is worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So there is, a, there is a theme that is woven into Paul's divinely inspired writings, and it is the theme of worthiness. Conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy. Walk in a manner that is worthy. So at this point, we are faced with a couple of questions. Number one is this, is God really worthy? Is God really worthy? How worthy of our lives is Christ? How worthy of our lives is the gospel of our Lord? Is Jesus worth maybe 50% of our lives? Is he worth most parts of our lives. Maybe we should divide our lives into different categories and say, God, you can have this category, you can have this category, you can have this category, but this one here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep for myself. I think I can handle this category a little bit better than you can. How worthy is God of our lives? You know, it's interesting, but the English word worship actually comes from an old English word that is worth-ship. Worth-ship. And at its most basic level, worship is ascribing praise to that which we deem worthy of our praise, that which we deem to have the worth that is required for us to worship that thing or that person or whatever it might be. Now, biblically, the Hebrew word commonly used for worship means to bow the neck. The Greek word for worship that is commonly used means to bow the knee. So in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the idea of worship has to do with our posture before God. It is, it is humbling ourselves before God because we recognize his worth based on who he is and what he has done for us, ascribing worship to God because of his worth. So here's the question, how worthy is God? How worthy is God? I want you to listen to some verses for just a couple of minutes that remind us of who God is. Listen to these verses. First of all, we are reminded in the scriptures he is our creator. Acts 17, 24, and 25, it says the God who made the world and all things in it. Listen, we are not here by random chance. We are not here by a big bang that took place millions or billions of years ago. The God who made the world and the fullness thereof, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath. Not only that, he is sovereign. Listen to first. Timothy 6.15, it says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, unless we don't understand exactly what that means, then he says this, The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Not only that, he is omnipresent. He is all places at all times with his whole being. Listen to Jeremiah 23, 23 and 24. God says this, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God who is far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so that I do not see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. Omnipresent. Not only that, he is omniscient. He knows all things. 1 John 3, 20 says this, For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. He is all-powerful. Isaiah 14, 27 says, For the Lord of hosts, which that in and of itself describes his power, The Lord, Yahweh, the God of the the armies of heaven, for the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his outstretched hand, who can turn it back? He is holy. Psalm 99, verse 9, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for holy is the Lord our God. He is wrathful against sin. Hebrews 1, 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. And then perhaps the greatest couple of verses in the Bible that, that where God specifically lays out who he is, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it says, Then the Lord, and again, this is Yahweh, the divine name of God, then the Lord passed by in front of him, being Moses, and proclaimed, listen to this, here's God's declaration about himself, his self-attestation, if you will. He said, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So God owns it all. 
He made all things. He sustains all things. He rules over all. Listen, he knows all. He sees all. He judges all. And he has all authority and all power to act against sin according to his perfect knowledge. And listen, that is terrible news for us. Unless, unless we understand the gospel that this book lays out for us. If we understand the gospel, there we find the mercy of God. There we find the grace of God. There we find the love of God because revealed in the gospel is the reality, 1 John 4, 8, that God is love. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so the Christian, when we read Ephesians 1, we glory in this. We thank God for this. But Ephesians 1, 7, and 8, it says, in Christ we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to, listen, the riches of his grace which he lavished on us. And so my friends, I ask you right now, do you believe these things about God? Do we believe these things to be true or not? Question number one, is God really worthy? And here is the answer to that question. He is absolutely, fully, and eternally worthy of everything in our lives. Question number two out of that. Once that has been established in our hearts, what then does it practically mean that the Christian should walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ? Here's what it means. Convinced of the worthiness of God, we as Christians then seek to align our lives 100% with the will of God and the ways of God. It means to know God, through Jesus Christ, it means to love God, to pursue God, and to walk in his ways while rejecting the ways of this world. Here's what it means. It means complete surrender to the lordship of Jesus. It is to live one's life as a follower of Jesus in such a way that is consistent with the gospel that we say we believe and love. And here's the beauty in this. We have so many tools at our disposal to help us in this journey in life. For example, back to what I mentioned a few moments ago, listen to Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, where we find, again, very similar language to what Paul writes here. Colossians 1, 9 and 10, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, since the day we heard of your faith in Christ, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled, listen to this, with the knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Being filled with the knowledge of God's will so that, in order that, we will be able to walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord. In other words, in order to walk in a manner that is worthy of the Lord requires for us to know what he wants from us, right? To have a knowledge of his will. How do we know God's will? Well, there, there, there are various ways that God speaks to us. I'm not going to go in a lot of depth here, but the primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. It is through the scriptures, we know who God is, and we generally and specifically know what God desires from us and for us because he has revealed those things to us in his word. Now, some might say right now, well, you know, I really don't, I really don't care all that much about the Bible. It's just an old book. It's got some good stuff in it, but it's an old book. I really don't know a lot about God, I guess, but I just try to live my life as morally and as good as possible. But here's the issue with that. What we know and then truly believe out of what we know always is always going to affect the way we live our lives in this world. So how do we conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel? First, we must be convinced, absolutely foundationally convinced that God is who he says he is. We must be convinced, as already stated, of the immense worthiness, the eternal worthiness of God. And then we've got to go before him to find out what he wants from us in order for us to live our lives in a way that honors him. If we don't know who God is and what he wants from us, then we cannot live our lives in a manner that is worthy of him. Do you know why there are so many people that go through life making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision in life? It's because they don't have a knowledge of who God is, and therefore they don't have a knowledge of his will for them. Because of that, they simply, and, and here's the danger in this, because of that, they simply try to live their lives according to the wisdom of this world. And here's what is so scary about that. James 3.15 tells us that the wisdom that is from this world, he writes, is natural, and listen, demonic. 
demonic wisdom. To live in godly wisdom then only comes through pursuing God and His ways. God speaks to us primarily through His Word, so we need to read it. We need to study it. We need to value it. We need to treasure it. We need to memorize Scripture. And most importantly, we need to obey what we read. Beyond the Word of God, again, I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here. Christians have so many other tools at our disposal to help us walk in a manner that is worthy of our Lord. We have the, as Ashton said during one of the songs, we have the Holy Spirit of God. If we know Christ, if we have been born again, the Holy Spirit of God comes to live within us. The third person of the Trinity living within us, tabernacling within us. And the Bible says that he is our helper, that he empowers us to accomplish what God calls us to. In fact, have you ever thought about this? In John 16, 7, Jesus said this to his disciples, and it had to shock them. But Jesus said this. He said, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, that statement alone, the disciples had to be like, what? I mean, you're with us in the flesh. We can look you in the eyes. We can touch you with our hands. We can hear your words. And yet Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Listen to this. Here's what he said. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So think about this. In the gospels, when Jesus was physically with his disciples, the disciples really struggled, didn't they? I mean, we, they were impulsive. They were fearful. They did and said a lot of dumb things. They often struggled to comprehend the truth that Jesus taught. However, after Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came to permanently indwell the people of God, you see a very different group of disciples. They were not perfect by any stretch, just like none of us are, but they were bold. They were wise. Many of them, majority of them went on to be martyred for their faith. Why? The Holy Spirit now lived within them just like he does in us today who know Christ. We have the scriptures, we have the spirit of God, we have the church. We have other Christians to help us, to encourage us, to pray for us. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. We have Ephesians chapter 6 tells us the whole armor of God. We have the armor of God and all that goes along with that at our disposal in order to be strong in the Lord, as it says there, in the strength of his might so that we will be able to stand firm against the devil and his schemes. We have all that we need in Christ to conduct ourselves as Christians in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, let me share something else here that I think is really important. Just because a person lives their life in a manner that is worthy of the Lord does not mean that their life is always going to be easy. It doesn't mean their life is always going to be safe. It doesn't mean it's always going to be without trial. In fact, I read earlier verses 29 and 30, for your sake it has been granted, uh, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him but also suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Here is Apostle, the Apostle Paul living his life in a manner that was worthy of the gospel. He was conducting himself in a manner that was worthy of his Lord when he wrote this letter, fully surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. And yet, he was incarcerated by the Roman state when he wrote this letter because of his obedience to Jesus, which, my friends, is a great reminder, once again, that Christians belong to a better kingdom. We belong to a better kingdom than the kingdom of this world. And as we've been studying today, our ethics and our values are different than this world's. And at the end of the day, please listen to what I'm about to say. I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen in the next 10 years, but I will say this. We must obey our king. We must. Who our president is, what our laws are, must not change how we live our lives in this world. It must not change the resolve that is within our hearts that, Lord, I am going to live my life in a manner that is worthy of you, fully surrendered to our Lord, even if that means difficulty and opposition and rejection. But also remember this, this letter, Philippians here, has been rightly called the letter of joy. You see, the intersection of joy and trial is part of the Christian experience in this fallen and broken world, which is not our home. Paul was experiencing this. There are Christians around the world that are experiencing pain and persecution because they foundationally, fully, eternally believe that Jesus is worthy of everything. And here Paul was calling on the Philippian church to be a church that collectively conducted themselves 
in a manner that was worthy of the gospel of Christ because they loved God. God God-centered focus produces God-honoring obedience. Your bulletin has point number two, and for you type A's, this is going to drive you crazy. We're not going to do point two this week. Time doesn't allow us, but I, I do want to close with this illustration. I shared this a long time ago, I believe, but it's a great illustration, I think. It's a historical illustration. David Livingston, many of you have heard his name. He was a great missionary who lived in the 1800s. David Livingston was a Scottish physician, and he was a devout follower of Jesus Christ. And one day in God's providence, Livingston heard a speech from a missionary by the name of Robert Moffat. And this speech was about the lostness in this world and the needs in this world. And Livingston became deeply convicted. Livingston would then choose to spend his life in Africa in the mid-1800s, early to mid-1800s in Africa, seeking to reach unreached peoples with the message of Christ. In 1857, he gave a well-known speech at Cambridge University in England after spending the previous 15 years in Central and Southern Africa. A little, little context on this story here, uh, uh, the story of this speech here. The students at Cambridge at this time had a tradition of, of kind of heckling their speakers to see if they could mess up their speech, to see how good the speaker was at keeping his composure. Please don't get any ideas from that. We don't want that here. However, when Livingston walked onto that stage, it was said that there was complete silence because they knew Livingston's story and they knew about his devotion and his sacrifice. And in his speech, Livingston recounted the difficulty and some of the trials he experienced in Africa. And there were many. It was a difficult life in many ways. For example, in 1844, he was attacked by an African lion and almost lost his life. And as a result, he had pain the rest of his life from that attack. He talked about the difficulty and the peril of traveling through the, at that time, uncharted African territories. He spoke of the resistance to the gospel by some of the people and the openness by some of the tribes as well. And near the end of his speech, after retelling so many stories of trial and pain and God's faithfulness, listen to Livingston's own words. He said, For my own part, I have never ceased to rejoice that God has appointed me to such an office. People talk of the sacrifice I have made in spending so much of my life in Africa. Can that be called a sacrifice? which is simply paid back as a small part of a great debt owing to our God, which we can never repay. Is that a sacrifice which brings its own blessed reward in healthful activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny hereafter? Away with the word in such a view and with such a thought. It is emphatically no sacrifice. Say rather it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, or danger now and then with a foregoing of the common conveniences and charities of this life may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing when compared with the glory which shall hereafter be revealed in and for us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made, who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. Only conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Is Christ worthy enough to have your life? Is the apparel of my life appropriate to the gospel that I stand here every Sunday morning and proclaim to believe? Would you bow your heads right now and close your eyes? Here in just a minute as we begin to sing this song of worship, an appropriate song called, Is He Worthy? I'm just going to be standing on this front row singing, standing up here at the front. If you need to come and talk, just just slip out of your seat and come up front, and I'll be standing up here at my seat, and I would love to talk with you about this. But I want to challenge you right now, is Christ worthy of your life? 
Have you surrendered your life fully to the Lordship of Christ? I'm not asking if you've simply said in your mind, yeah, Jesus is okay. He did great things. I'm asking, have you yielded your life in repentance and faith to the one who gave himself on the cross and rose again? Do you know Christ as Lord and Savior? And then Christian in the room right now, how's your apparel? The apparel of your life, is it fitting and suitable to the gospel and to the Lord that we say we believe and love? If not, just repent today. Say, God, there are areas of my life right now you know are not lined up, so God, help me, forgive me, mold me and make me, and give me a new resolve through the power of your Holy Spirit, the power of God working mightily within me to live my life in a way that is honoring to you. Father, right now, we thank you so much for your word. It is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Lord, help us to love you. Lord, those right now who are wavering in their belief right now, only help their unbelief. God, do in our hearts what we could never do right now. Convict us, encourage us, mold us and make us into the image of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and let's sing this song of worship to our great God. Is broken. Do you feel the shadows deepen? Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? Do you wish that you could see it all made new? Every people and tribe, every nation and turn. 
kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of our blessing and Three, fourteen through 19 it says for this reason I bow my knees before the father from whom, every from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Hope you have a wonderful week this week. Thank you so much for being here this morning.